Okay, good morning, everybody. It is sunrise out here in Lebanon, and uh, I'm going to read chapters uh, 10. No, I'm sorry, yeah, 10 and 11. I'm going to do 10 and 11 today. Uh, 10 is called The Knife is Ready, and 11 is The Woman from Rama, uh, Rama. And that is the one that they've been talking about that is as powerful as a thousand armed men. All right, so the first one is titled, The Knife is Ready. The Knife is Ready. Okay, we'll find out what that means. Remember, uh, Uriah, Jabin, and uh, Jotham are now with, uh, with uh, Barak uh, Ab ben Abinoam, I think. Yeah, Barak ben Abinoam. And uh, they are in the, temp uh, the tents of Hushai ben Aaron, I think is his name. Um, and I think they're part of the Naphtali uh, tribe of Hebrews. So they are in these tents um, and they had an uh, evening meal. We'll find out what they plan on doing, what, what's going on. All right, chapter 10, the knife is ready. Though the hangings of the tent kept out most of the sun, there were streaks of light across the face of Jabin when I awoke. Jotham was already stirring, and I heard the sounds of women preparing food. I thought that I would tell Jotham what I had heard before I had slept. Jotham listened and looked at me in amazement. Barak bin Abinoam, he said. I was told of him when I was a child. He is a great man of the Naphtalites, a judge of Kadesh, and a great fighter. Once, when he was young, he led his tribe against the slave raiders of the Amalekites, and there were no more raids for a year. What is he doing here? But I had other things to discuss with Jotham, for I had told myself that today would be the day when Jotham and I would part company. I had already half decided to go back to Tyre explain what had happened, and take my chances. Jotham was as safe by now as he ever would be, and I would surely say nothing to betray him. But when I told Jotham this, he shook his head, and the words sent a chill into my heart. You cannot go back today, he said. You cannot leave here, and neither can I. What are you saying? I cried. Who has told you this? Are we prisoners? Hushai himself has told me, said Jotham patiently. He has told me that there is trouble in the hills and that we must remain in his tents till it is proved whether we are friends or enemies. So they have to prove themselves. Are they friends or are they enemies of these people? I looked around in astonishment and anger at the big bustling encampment of Hushai, noisy with the bawling of animals. Once again, I met the eyes of Samuel. Remember, Samuel is the same age as Jotham and uh, Uriah, and he is the uh, brother of Tamar. He was smiling now, and his smile worried me more than anything. Jotham had said, suddenly, I found that I was afraid. We went into the hills with the men that morning, as it was the custom among the tribes for guests to make themselves useful. We took Jabin with us, and he watched all that went on in wonder and growing delight. It was as new to me as it was to him, for my father had kept no sheep. I had always thought of them as placid creatures who would follow anyone or anything that led them, but it was not so. They ran and jumped and cried out and pushed one another till I wondered how anyone could have the patience to bother with the stupid creatures. Jabin did not help matters. He was greatly excited and ran about bleating like the lambs and laughing shrilly. Several times he sent them scattering, and it was hard work to round them up again. Jotham, for some reason, had become very fond of Jabin and would not correct him. So it was I who finally shook him till his neck was nearly broken and threatened him with worse if he did not listen and learn and stop running about. Barak, too, had gone with us, and I watched in amazement his skill with the animals. Hi, 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 he would shout 
like the loudest of the shepherds, using his stave like a martial staff. And it was hard to believe that this contented herdsman was a famous fighter and a judge of the town of Kadesh. At midday, we lay at our ease, ate bread and cheese, and drank from a water skin as we gazed far off to the north at the towering white tops of the great mountains, home of the gods. Baal Herman lives there, said Jabin dreamily. Samuel looked at him sternly, saying, Baal Herman has no power here. He can only stay on his mountain. He is not as the Lord, our God, who can travel with us wherever we go in the ark. What is an ark? It was Barak who replied, lying on his back, gazing intently into the cloudless sky. The ark is the golden house of the Lord that our people built for him when we found him in the desert on the Sinai mountain. You remember the story about Moses finding the ark? Uh, and they and they had the Ten Commandments inside and all that. He is a God of fire and thunder, and our fathers say that when our people fled from Egypt, they heard his voice and saw the light of his face on top of that mountain, and they knew that only he could keep them safe in the desert and bring them home again to Canaan. So they built him the ark that they might carry him with them on the shoulders of four strong men and have him near wherever they wander. Where is he now? asked Jabin, sounding a little frightened. Barak turned his head and smiled at him. In the south, guarded by the tribe of Ephraim, in a fine tent of many colors. Then how can he be here and protect me from Malak? Jabin sounded more frightened still. No other god can withstand him, wherever he is, Barak assured him. But Jabin did not look too certain. Barak laughed and ruffled his hair. For some reason, I found myself thinking of the Lady Maris' story of the accursed pharaoh and the beautiful lady, and how they had laughed with their children in the sunlit temple of their god. But Barak did not smile or laugh with Jotham or with me. And the young man Samuel did not speak to us at all, only watched us and uh, now and then with that strange smile. Something surely was wrong. As the day wore on, my heart grew heavier and heavier with fear of what the night might bring. Toward evening, we kindled a fire for the evening meal. There was a little talk, and I thought that Barak and Samuel seemed to be waiting for something. Even the little boy, Aphia, seemed to know something that we did not, and when he thought we were not looking, watched us with scared, solemn eyes. Nothing had happened by the time we had finished eating, and later we stretched ourselves in our robes by the fire and settled ourselves for sleep. I began to think I had been afraid only from cowardice and not from any real reason. Jabin came close to Jotham and me, whispering, Will it get too cold when the fire is out? We must take our turns watching so the fire will not go out, said Jotham. It will keep away the beast, too. That's good, said Jabin. Almost before the words were out of his mouth, he was asleep. But I did not sleep for a while, and I knew that Jotham did not either, though he lay so still beside me. Once I looked at him out of the corner of my eyes and saw him motionless on his back, staring into the dark sky. Nothing about him moved except his lips, and I saw that he was whispering some soundless prayer. I shuddered, for there was no image before him. To what was he praying? Deeply troubled, I turned away from him and, after a while, slept. But my sleep was broken. I dreamt of my father who gazed at me in my sleep with grieving eyes. Who are these people who despise our gods? He asked me. And what are you doing among them? Only evil can come of a broken promise. Then his face dissolved into a blinding light and I awoke with a cry the light of a torch blazing into my eyes. 
Samuel stood smiling above me. We have been called to the tents, he said. The woman from Ramah is here. I started to my feet and shook my head to clear it. I knew that whatever it was I had been afraid of was upon us. What woman? What, what, what woman? I mumbled, remembering the talk I had heard between Barak and Hushai and my dream of the night before. The firelight shone red on the dark young face of Samuel, making him look like some long-ago savage out of the desert. She is a seeress, he said softly. She has had many visions from the great God. She will tell us if your friend is a true man of Ephraim or if you are only Canaanite spies. My heart sank, remembering the sacred old women of our village at home with their glaring eyes and their spells and curses. And, I said, if she tells you we are spies, Samuel's eyes gleamed. An altar stone has been raised on a high place not far away, he said, his voice shaking a little. The sacred knife is ready. If her judgment goes against you, the mighty Java will have his sacrifice tonight. Okay, so she's going to judge if, uh, if uh, Jotham and Uriah are spies from Canaan, and if they are, they will be killed. If they are not, they something else will happen. I don't know what. We'll find out. Let's go meet this woman. Chapter 11, the woman from Ramah. Changes had been made on the grounds where the tents were pitched. Two new ones had been thrown up, I suppose, for the women of Ramah and her, the woman of Ramah and her servants. And they were finer than any I had seen before, striped in gay colors, the tents were all lit by torches, and we could see that people were moving about within them in great excitement. Outside, there was the tinkling of bells on pack animals and much braying of donkeys. Leah, the first wife of Hushai, came to meet us, hastening toward her son. She's in the tent of your father, she said in a hurried, excited voice. Your sister has brought water for you from the well. Hurry and make yourself clean. What a pity there is no time to dress the child in fine clothes he, in the fine clothes he wore last night. Mother, cried Samuel. Oh, never mind, said Le uh, Leah impatiently. Go wash yourself. Then her eyes fell upon Jotham and me, and she fell silent and turned pale. We went to the water buckets in the yard, which smelled of goats and sheep. It reminded me of the smell of the barnyards at home so that my legs began to tremble a little less. It seemed we were expected to make ourselves very fine, and in sudden defiance, I splashed myself with water from the buckets and gave great attention to the braiding of my hair. What do you think that means? In defiance, he's going to braid his hair now. I think it has something to do with him saying, you know what? I am what I am. I'm a Hittite. I'm proud to be a Hittite. And I'm going to walk in there and tell you I'm a Hittite by the way I look. I regretted that my golden ornaments and earrings had been sunk in the sea. If this were to be my death night, I wanted to meet it like a Hittite lord. At last, we were ready Fear came upon me again as we walked to the tent of Hushai. At the entrance, an odor reached us that seemed familiar to me. I could just remember it from the old days at home, on the race, on the rare occasions when caravans would come to Arzawa carrying supplies from the far distant Hindus Valley. It was the odor of a brew of tea leaves, which at home had been thought one of the rarest pleasures of the great world. To find it here in this wild place made everything seem stranger than ever. We entered the tent into the light of the torches. A little lady was seated on a pile of the best rugs and cushions owned by Hushai ben Aaron. Others had been set aside for Barak, who sat beside her, watching her steadily. This, then, was the woman from Ramah. She was far from being the wild-eyed holy woman I had expected. 
She was dressed in a fine woven robe of many colors with a golden net upon her head. Her hands were little, delicate, and wrinkled, and there were rings on her fingers. I supposed she was old, but her skin was fair and soft, her eyes bright and black. The family and servants of Shai ben Aaron were staring at her as if she herself were a vision. She has a house, I heard Leah whisper to her son, and lives all the year on a farmland not far from the town of Gilgal, where the great altar stones are. Come into the light, the woman, said the woman, peering into the shadows where we stood. Her voice was not old at all, but brisk and strong. Hushai ben Aaron urged us forward. Jabin clung to both our hands, staring in awe at the sorceress, but he was not as frightened as he had been, for she was not nearly so different from the old ladies he had known before. She looked at me, at, uh, she looked first at me. A Hittite, of course, she said. The fair skin, the braid, the manner of a lord, and the hands of a farmer. Who could mistake him? I bowed to her with much respect, for she was surely a great lady, even though a seeress and a tribeswoman of the hill people, and even though she held my life in her hands. Come here, child, she said to Jabin, and he went to her trustingly, bowed with his hands to his heart like any well-bred little Canaanite boy. Whoever they are, this one is harmless enough, she said. Well, why are you staring? Have they told you I see visions? Are you a seeress? Asked Jabin in a small voice. Do the Holy Ones talk to you? Sometimes the Holy One talks to me, said the woman seriously, but not through magic signs and sacred dice. Tamar, put him to bed. I saw that she wanted Tamar to leave as much as Jabin. The fear came back to me more strongly than ever, though I was glad to know for sure that Jabin was safe. Now the woman had turned toward Jotham and her face had changed. It was hard and grave like the face of a judge. Remember, if she says they die, then J uh, Jotham and Uriah will die. Jabin now is already safe. You say you are an Ephraimite, she said to him. From what part of the land? My father had flocks, he said, that grazed near Bethel, the house of God in the south. I know the people of Bethel, said the woman. I have not seen you among them. I have not been among them since I was a child, said Jotham, but I have seen you. And who am I? You are Deborah, the wife of Lapidoth, said Jotham. When your husband lived, he sometimes let my father water his beasts on your land. You were the lady of the great house under the palm tree, the first of the tribe of Ephraim. The woman, Deborah, beckoned him closer and looked intently into his face. I have seen a face like yours, she said, and I have heard a story. Who was your father? Amram, said Jotham, Amram ben Omri. The woman of Ramah sighed and closed her eyes. Surely, she said, that was the story. Suddenly Samuel sprang to his feet. Any man can give a false name, he cried. And if he is who he says he is, still he comes from Tyre and has lived with the evil ones for many years. Condemn them both, great lady. A terrible time is coming upon us, and our God will be better pleased for a sacrifice. Be still. The voice of Barak was not loud, but it filled the tent. The torchlight shone in his eyes and blazed black from them, and he seemed like a man I had never seen before. Barak, I thought, lightning. Who are you to speak to a woman of God who has had visions? God will demand to sacrifice, not you or any of us here. So that made Barak upset that Samuel spoke out of turn. He spoke out of turn while, uh, um, while Deborah was trying to talk, and that was not smart. 
The eyes of the woman Deborah were fixed somberly on the image of the golden bull that Jotham had looked upon so scornfully the night before. That God would be better pleased for a sacrifice, she said, whether of just or unjust men, he is not mine. Samuel sat back angrily, muttering that the household image had been in his family for hundreds of years and that uh, and had been brought with them from Egypt, but he said no more. For a while, the woman was silent, swaying slightly, her eyes closed. Suddenly, they opened, and she set her hands firmly on Jotham's shoulders and gazed deeply into his eyes. There was silence in the tent of Hushai. The family and the servants hardly daring to breathe. Her hands moved down his arms and fastened upon his wrists. I thought that she was seeing a vision. His eyes do not falter, she said in a soft, thin voice, and his blood beats as calm as mine. Suddenly she pressed his hands and put him away from her. God is judged. This is a true man of Israel. There will be no sacrifice tonight. If Deborah says it, then it is so, said Barak. There was a murmur of awe in the tent, and I felt myself beginning to tremble all over. I could not believe that it was finished, that I had really been saved from death. Deborah turned again to Jotham and spoke in her usual brisk manner. I knew your father, she said, and I knew your uncle better still. Those scoundrels down in Gaza, we've heard that before. I had a shaky desire to laugh. She sounded so like Ethbal. But the tribes have seen the light, and the curse of the judges has been upon your uncle for many years now. So they're not too fond of Jotham's uncle um, because he is a scoundrel. He cheats people, and he cheated uh, Jotham. He does not dare return to the hills. Suddenly Samuel, who had been very quiet, spoke again. What about him? He said, looking at me, I saw that as he was now forbidden to hate Jotham, he hated me more than ever. Samuel wants to hate somebody. He wants to find an enemy. He wants to find someone to uh, blame for everything that's happened. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Deborah looked at me for a long time without speaking, though I knew I was in no more danger. I found that I could not meet her eyes, even now. I am filled with this shame, as I remember. For though I did not know it then, I know now that my treachery to these people was already in my heart. There is no need for uh, a judgment on him, said Deborah. He is a stranger who has done us no harm. We have only to show him the hospitality that has been the custom of our fathers. Suddenly, free of my fear of death, a great curiosity came upon me. Why was the woman Deborah here? Why had she traveled so far? Why had a much revered woman of God come from the south to meet with a famous war leader and an important man of the northern tribe? Why were they so afraid of Canaanite spies? And why had Samuel said that a terrible time was coming upon them? I was a stranger, and I knew they did not trust me, but I promised myself that I would find out the answers. I did not sleep that night, and I heard Jotham now moving restlessly beside me. Jotham, I whispered. Are you thinking of Tyre? Yes, said Jotham. If you, go, if you could go back, I whispered, would you? I would never go back, he said quietly. I saw that he meant it. The same look was in his eyes that had been there when he had lain so still underneath the stars. She is a great lady, I said. Who? muttered Jotham. The seeress from Ramah. She would have been a great lady even in Hattusis. Suddenly Jotham rose on his elbow, and there was a look of pride and joy and scorn in his eyes. Hattusis? That city of horse catchers? Does she not spring from a race of men who were lords in Egypt? Okay, so that's all she wrote for now. And uh, Jotham and Uriah averted disaster. They're going to live. Um, it sounds like Uriah has a lot of respect for these people, these Hebrews. But at the same time, 
he is going to commit treachery against them. And the author foreshadowed that for us. So the next one is chapter 12, the Lord is a man of war. Okay. All right. Very interesting. If you have questions, we'll see each other at our meetings and we'll talk about it. All right. You guys take care. Have a good afternoon and enjoy yourselves. Bye-bye.